Dr. Shai Jumon. And uh, let me just tell you very briefly how this paper came about. Uh, this is actually a kind of a, a collaboration between CDS, uh, Center for Development Studies, uh, which is a development economics center based in Trivandrum, and uh, the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, which is also based in Trivandrum. And as part of the new education policy of the government, uh, which has been welcoming multidisciplinary work, uh, uh, the CDS and the IIST decided to join together in two activities, basically in uh, teaching and also in research. And as far as teaching is concerned, my colleagues have gone and taken classes at the IIST in game theory. And as far as research is concerned, we decided to do a paper which was uh, long uh, required because given the existence of uh, absence or rather, rather the absence of such studies on measuring the size of India's space economy. So I think uh, we are very lucky that we have managed to complete the study without any funding. And, uh, and this was completed in the last one year. And, uh, and just to demonstrate the kind of confidence that we have in terms of multidisciplinary research with uh, space scientists and economists working together. Okay. And uh, to chair the webinar, we have a very distinguished uh, space aerospace scientist here, Professor B. N. Suresh. He is currently the Chancellor of the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. He is also a distinguished uh, uh, honorary professor at the ISRO headquarters in Bangalore. And uh, he was also, I must say, for the founding director of the Indian Institute of uh, Space Science and Technology. He founded the institute in 2007 and was its director until 2010. Now, I must say that uh, we are very fortunate in having him here because he joined the ISRO way back in 1969 when the ISRO itself was established. And uh, he rose to become uh, the uh, director of the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center during the year 2003 to 7. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that. And uh, 2003 to 7. And then in 2007, he took over as the founding director of the IIST. Now, Professor B. N. Suresh has several, uh, um, you know, uh, achievements to his credit. In terms of technology, um, uh, he's basically a mechanical engineering engineer by training with a master's from uh, IIT Madras, of which he's a very distinguished alumni, and then a PhD uh, from the Salford University in the United Kingdom on a Commonwealth uh, scholarship. And uh, subsequently, he has been on the uh, uh, board of governors of the IIT for over IIT Madras for about seven years, and he has also been a visiting professor at IIT, uh, other IITs, and also at MIT Manipal. Okay, and in terms of his contributions to technology, he was very much involved in advanced launch vehicles, which we will talk about um, in terms of its uh, uh, size, uh, which is the GSLV Mark III, and also reusable launch vehicle technology demonstrator and air breathing propulsion. And he has published quite extensively. And uh, in fact, one of his most recent books is, uh, uh, is the space is the book which is edited by him called Space and Beyond, uh, which is actually the professional voyage of uh, Professor uh, K. Kasturi Rankin, uh, again a very distinguished uh, space scientist. Okay, and this book is published by Springer. So, Professor Pian Suresh, a very warm welcome to CTS. And I think this is the first time you are visiting CTS at least virtually, and, uh, and we look forward to your guidance in conducting uh, the proceedings this afternoon. Again, once again, a very warm welcome to all of our uh, distinguished guests, especially the uh, distinguished guests from the space community, which who has joined us uh, this afternoon. So over to you, Professor Suresh. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Sunil Mani, for the nice introduction and uh, I must also thank uh, Professor Dadwal for roping me in for this uh, uh, particular webinar. And uh, when he requested me, I felt quite happy because uh, this is uh, one of the areas I also have a lot of uh, interest, particularly the space economy. Again, uh, that got uh, revitalized because, as you said rightly, I got an opportunity to edit the book which Dr. Kastor Rangan requested me and uh, while we were discussing several uh, areas of his contribution, uh, 
I told him, sir, I have read uh, the book published by Professor Shankar of uh, Madras School of Economics in Chennai, particularly on the space economy, which was again initiated by Dr. Kasturangan himself. And then uh, he has done almost a very elaborate study. And then uh, he has done the cost benefit analysis of Indian space program. I told him, sir, uh, in all the contributions, uh, we should bring that. He says it was almost a decade back, and how do we go about? And uh, that time it occurred to me that uh, at uh, IAST, Professor Shaiju Moon is very keen to work in the economy, and I linked uh, Professor Shaiju Moon with uh, Professor Kasturangan, and both of them, they worked together. And there's a chapter in that book, uh, Space and beyond, written particularly on the space economy cost and benefit analysis, I think jointly authored. It has come quite well. In fact, uh, after the book is released, uh, we got several feedback from uh, several people, particularly in the science and technology area when you are working, and uh, more so in space, uh, which is really handled by totally government of India. We are able to still study the economy and bring out the tangible and intangible benefits to the country. You know, that was a very interesting observation. And uh, also, I was telling uh, to our IST, being uh, economics uh, department there, they need to really take it further. And I'm very happy to see that uh, Professor Dadwal encouraged, and he also sort of spent a lot of time and uh, roped in. Uh, Professor Sunil Mani to undertake this uh, very, very latest study of India's space economy for the last decade, almost uh, 2011, 12 to 2021. And uh, I just happened to, because he sent me a copy of that uh, paper. I don't want to spend my time because I'm sure you're going to present on that. But what is more interesting is that, uh, you know, the, the attempt made again to look at the size of space economy in India and also, it's not easy to really analyze and uh, address the space economy. It would be extremely difficult. And, uh, you know, all that, whatever we discuss, it has several segments like launch vehicle, the spacecraft, the space applications, space manufacturing. Then, of course, there are uh, several wings. And how do we really sort of assess the the money that goes into that, that too from the public exchequer, uh, that is one thing. And at the same time, all of you are aware that in the last uh, two years, the government of India has given a directive to go for what we term as the space reforms, because they would like to rope in all uh, private operators to get into space, and this row should uh, really help them to hold their hands. And unless we do that in the beginning, the economy will not uh, really flourish. I think that way I, I can tell you that this uh, space economy is going to go in a big way in the coming decade. And you have really addressed this issue right in time at this point of time. Anyway, we, we are all uh, waiting to listen to you of what you have done and what are your projections and what is there in store. So this paper has been authored by three for the benefit of all who are attending this particular program, uh, Professor Sunil Mani is the director and professor, RBHA Center of Development Studies. I think he is the person possibly who is going to present the paper associated with uh, Professor Dadwal, who himself uh, here presently is the Indira Gandhi Chair Professor for Environmental Sciences at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. But more than that, he has done tremendous work in the area of applications at Indian Space uh, Research Organization, particularly in the area of agriculture. And uh, of course, almost five long years, he really saw that IAST moving from one level to next level. Tremendous amount of development has been uh, guided and uh, directed by Professor Dadwar. And also he is the person behind to encourage the studies on space economy. I think uh, being a science and technology institute to, to, to promote and then give encouragement to space economy is for pretty, pretty very good. And of course, uh, uh, Saiju Moon, uh, he is the, really the 
key person in the whole activity who has been pushing the economic activities and uh, I hope that uh, he is one person who will take it forward the space economy not only uh, take it from here to when we go for uh, uh, with the private agencies and open up with all this uh, uh, what we term as the lean space the ncl and all this reform but it would take time i would suppose another one or two years before it stabilizes but they think there is a lot more in store for this with these viewers uh, let me welcome all who are here in this uh, particular session and uh, i would request professor sunil mani to take over and then go ahead with the presentations thank you okay thank you very much professor bian suresh uh, and uh, uh, i am going to the presentation on behalf of uh, my, my collaborators, Professor Dudwal and also Dr. Shai Jumon. They have also contributed quite uh, well to this paper. So I'm going to share my slides first. Uh, can, some, can someone see whether I can see the slides? It, it has come and uh, you have to make it full screen. Yeah, is it full screen now? It, yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, as Professor B.N. Suresh said, this is actually a study on the space economy of India, and we have tried to measure its size and structure using an internationally accepted framework. So, the way we are going to do this uh, study is uh, uh, we will start, first start with the motivation for doing this exercise, and then we will do a quick survey of the various analytical frameworks which are available for measuring the size of uh, a space economy. We will have a brief uh, issue specific engagement with the existing literature on India's space sector. And then using the in one of the frameworks, we will uh, provide the contours of India's space economy. We will go quite deep into nine different aspects and uh, then we will measure the size and structure and then we will have conclude the presentation. And uh, while concluding the presentation, we will also identify some areas for further research where uh, um, yeah, which can be mounted. Now, let me start with the motivation. India is ranked as one of the most uh, uh, major spacefaring nations in the, especially in the developing world, uh, because India and Brazil and China are the three countries which have got uh, really space, uh, uh, you know, technology. And it has uh, got an acknowledged uh, capability in the full range of uh, space technology spectrum, right from designing satellites and launch vehicles launching them and also then tracking them over a period of time. Okay, then the Indian space sector has uh, existed for the last five decades. And as I was mentioning before, it started in 1969 here in Trivandrum. And if one were to look at the space sector over the years, we can see four different characteristics which stands out. First, it is one of the most rare examples from our country in terms of domestic technology capability building purely through indigenous efforts. And that too in a high technology sector. We do have instances of uh, domestic technology capability building in other sectors, um, um, in, in uh, medium uh, sectors, etc., medium technology sectors, etc. But in high technology, I think the space uh, space is one of the rare examples. Okay. And second uh, is that this uh, efforts were spearheaded entirely by public sector organization. The ISRO has been singularly responsible for developing the developing and nurturing the capability in this area for the last over the last five decades. Of course, the public sector has collaborated with a certain limited number of uh, private sector enterprises. So even during the earlier period, uh, what you see is even when the state was very much in control, it did involve certain private sector enterprises. And we will talk about that uh, a little later also when we talk about space manufacturing. Okay, and uh, and so the role of market in this arena has now uh, been enlarged. And in fact, the recent government policies is essentially to increase the space for more private sector operations in this particular area. Okay, and finally, uh, the space technology is also an excellent example of what is ref usually referred to as frugal innovation. That is, you are able to develop and uh, innovate a, a product without defeaturing it and at the same time offer it at costs which are much less than what is normally available. Now, just to give you a quick, quick example, uh, and uh, if you look at the Mars Orbiter, uh, Mars Orbiter mission, uh, the Mangalyan mission, if you take the total cost of that, which was reckoned to be about $74 million, and uh, if you compare that with an equivalent one from the NASA, which is the Marvin, 
that was about 671 million dollars so it's almost like a, a 10 times higher and later on when we talk about uh, the uh, space manufacturing in the economy, we will see that we are able to manufacture both satellites and launch vehicles at much cheaper cost compared to what is available in the West. So it's a really a good example of uh, 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 frugal innovations. So these are the reasons which motivates us to understand uh, uh, because so far we really do not have any studies which have looked at and tried to quantify the size of India's uh, space economy. And the space economy has also evolved into an important industry with a uh, uh, rapidly changing manufacturing component. And one of the most recent developments is the emergence of a number of startups uh, and some even having technology capability to design and manufacture small satellites and launch vehicles. And uh, uh, the state, uh, as I was mentioning before, the space economy is now in a state of flux. There are a lot of policy changes which have taken place. Government is slowly reducing its preeminent position in the sector and uh, it's throwing open a lot of these to private sector. In fact, even the manufacture of uh, satellites and launch vehicles is now thrown open to the private sector as well. And uh, then with, of course, with the growth of digital industries, the requirement of products and services from the space sector is bound to increase quite tremendously in the future. And in fact, the argument is that uh, space technology is slowly evolving into what we refer to as a general purpose technology, okay, just like IT, which is used in a number of other arenas as well. So notwithstanding the existence of uh, 50 years or so, there is very little understanding of what constitutes the uh, space economy. Uh, uh, you know, the chairperson, the, the chair, Professor Suresh referred to the very important study by uh, uh, Professor Yu Shankar, which was done in 2007. Uh, but he doesn't really measure the size of the space economy, uh, apart from mentioning the government budgets which are allocated to uh, the space sector. Now, I move on to the next thing, uh, next aspect, which is the analytical frameworks which are available for measuring the space economy. Now, you have three dominant uh, uh, measure of the frameworks which are available. The first one is the OECD framework. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development. And this framework was developed as far back in 2012. And the OECD has been quantifying the size of uh, or describing the, uh, it can only describe the OECD framework doesn't, as I will, I will explain to you a little later, doesn't allow you to arrive at a single number. So it will allow, allow you to have the contours of the space economy uh, delineated. Then you have the UK Space Agency framework, which was announced, uh, which was uh, introduced uh, as uh, uh, late as 2018 or so. And this framework has a number of interesting features, which I will uh, uh, talk about a little later. And of course, the most recent one is the US Bureau of Economic Analysis in year 2022, uh, in fact, January of this year, where they have, US is the only country in the world which has actually introduced a satellite account in its national accounts trying to measure the uh, uh, measure the size of its space economy and this is available for the period 2012 onwards up to about 2019 okay and so you have these three different frameworks so i will just quickly take you through these frameworks before i settle down with one of them so according the i start with the oecd framework because as i said it, it was the first one okay and it uh, uh, measures the space economy or conceives the space economy in three broad ways. It basically looks into the inputs to the space economy. Then it will look at the activities and outputs of the space economy. And lastly, it will also look at the impacts of the space economy. Although it is not immediately clear how impacts could, because impacts can be direct and indirect. And if you are going to include all those indirect imp impacts, then uh, you know the size of your uh, space economy can be quite large. And in fact, one uh, uh, even OECD's own computations of its or descriptions of the space economy, you don't re really find these impacts discussed in any great length. So basically, it's the inputs and output. And in terms of inputs, there are three indicators which the OECD has put forward on the table. The first one is share of the budget for space activities in a country's GDP or space budget as a percentage of GDP. In fact, almost everyone till uh, hitherto, when they talk about the size of the space economy, they have always referred to the space budget as a percentage of GDP. Okay. The second one is assets of the space sector, which is in terms of assets in orbit and also on the ground. 
because you have uh, satellites which are launched and which are already in a, uh, you know, sort of in the orbit, the, uh, the, they are also taken as part of the assets, including uh, all those satellites, launch vehicles, and, uh, and launch pads and all uh, scientific equipments, et cetera, which are available on the ground is also taken as part of these assets. The third is human capital employed in the space sector consisting of engineers, scientists, and marketing specialists. Okay. And of course, you can now already see that you really can't add up all these and arrive at a single number because you have uh, uh, some in physical numbers, some in, uh, you know, as a rate and some as, a, uh, you know, uh, as in value terms and so on. And some are stock figures and some are flow figures also. Then you have a bunch of output figures, about six uh, output indicators. You start with space manufacturing industry, which consists of satellite manufacturing and satellite launch vehicle manufacturing. Okay. Then you have satellite telecommunications, and uh, which consists basically of uh, location services, wherever satellite technology is actually used in providing telecom services, and in including that of uh, broadband internet. And also another important segment within this is direct to home, uh, uh, home, uh, you know, uh, television networks. Okay, which uh, which uh, I will talk about that a little later. Okay, then you have satellite Earth observation, uh, which is basically remote sensing, and as you know, remote sensing is possible also with uh, from the air using an aircraft. Okay, but here we are considering only those which are used uh, the remote sensing, which is done with satellite technology. Then is the insurance market for uh, uh, in, in the space for satellites and, and launch vehicles, and then of course international trade in space products, which is exports and imports of space products, and lastly innovation, and innovation of course is measured using three different indicators. You, you measure using patents, which is basically one of the most important uh, uh, metrics and output indicator of innovation, scientific publications, and also the number of uh, new uh, technology startups which are created uh, using space technology. So the OECD framework is basically uh, inputs and outputs, and uh, it basically allows you to delineate the contours of the space economy. And, but as I said, it will not result in arriving at a summary measure which you can express at a percentage of GDP. Because whenever you are measuring the size of an economy, you know, uh, uh, or in other words, a satellite, uh, say for instance, the information technology economy, or, uh, for instance, the ocean or the uh, marine products economy or the blue economy, as we call it, you know, we need to express that as a percentage of the GDP because a mere absolute measure of the size will not allow you to uh, interpret whether it's high or low. Okay, so the OECD framework, unfortunately, will not allow you to do it because for the reasons that I mentioned, because some are rates, some are absolute uh, values in rupees uh, or in US dollars. Uh, uh, and some are basically uh, stocks and some are flows. For instance, asset is a, a stock, whereas the annual amount of uh, budgetary uh, subventions to the space sector is a flow amount. Okay. So, uh, the, the uh, uh, and because of this motley assortment, uh, this OECD framework we really cannot use uh, to measure. And also, there is a possibility of double counting. Because space budget, everyone measures space budget as an important component of uh, the space economy. But the space budget also seeks to create a number of those uh, outputs that we talk about. So, uh, so the output, some of the output figures already include some of these input figures. So there's a problem of double counting. And here is a, uh, uh, the uh, using the OECD framework, the, uh, the size of the global space economy has been estimated by different agencies. And you can see wide variations in the estimates. The OECD itself has estimated the size of the space economy to be about 329 uh, billion dollars. This is these are in billions billions of dollars. Okay, and the figures in brackets are percentage increase uh, over the over 2016 over 2030. Okay, but if you look at the Science and Technology Policy Institute, which is a think tank based in Washington, uh, it has estimated the size of the space economy to be about 166. Uh, billion dollars, so almost uh, almost 100% uh, uh, less than what is estimated by uh, the Space Foundation uh, or, or the OECD. Okay, so you can see this wide variation. So it doesn't really allow you to have a clear cut uh, uh, understanding about the OECD framework. 
Okay, so the, the, the critical comments on the OECD framework have already given, so I will not go again into the details of that. So now I move on to the UK Space Agency framework. So what the UK Space Agency has done is basically divide the space economy into four segments. Starts with space manufacturing, and under space manufacturing, you have a number of uh, sectors like launch vehicles, subsystems, scientific instruments, etc., and so on. Now it's possible for you to find out the value of each of these, uh, and then uh, you can find out the total size of the space manufacturing sector. So here, only annual flows are considered, no stocks and flow considerations, and and uh, uh, and so and everything is in money value terms, either in value added terms or in uh, value of gross value of output terms. So it's possible for you to add up everything and arrive at the size of the space manufacturing. Likewise, space operations and then space applications, and then ancillary services. So UK Space Agency framework is eminently suited for the simple reason that it is a very elegant framework, quite comprehensive, distinguished between stocks and flows, and also uh, uh, no double counting is involved. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this framework is eminently uh, helpful. And also it is eminently helpful in understanding the subcomponents of each of those four broad components. So this is for these reasons, this is the framework that we will be using. And I must make a mention of the US Bureau of Economic Analysis framework, which came out just in a few months ago. And uh, as I said before, US is the only country in the world which seems to be having a real uh, uh, size of the space economy because they've used the national accounts. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a satellite account uh, to, the, to the US national accounts. As you know, national accounts of every country is uh, uh, ma uh, made using the system of national accounts of the UN, which is a framework which is available for measuring. Now, this requires, so what the US uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis has done is, they take every sector of the economy. Take, for instance, the economy is broadly divided into the primary sector, which is basically agriculture. Okay, and then you have the secondary sector, which is basically industry and, and manufacturing uh, and so on. And third is the tertiary or the services sector. So you have the three broad sectors of the uh, economy. Now, in each of the three sectors, they are able to identify the space component. And they are able to do that because they have detailed what is called supply and use tables for arriving at the national uh, accounts characteristics of the space economy, like gross output, value added, employment, and compensation or wages. These are what no, uh, the national accounts characteristics which and normally national account statisticians would use. So the detailed supply and use tables are available in the US uh, and, and unfortunately we don't, do not have that in the India at all. Okay. So the US, they, they have done this estimation. Uh, it's a one-off estimate uh, and, uh, and they have made very clear that they will not be doing this annually if money is not available to uh, conduct that kind of an exercise. So right now, what we have is uh, estimates available from 2012 until 2019. In fact, I would later on, after arriving at the Indian size of India space economy, compare that with the US one. And because the US one, at least from the national accounts po point of view, is the most robust or uh, estimate that's available. And of course, the advantages of the UK space agency framework, I have already given. And so I will not go into details of, of that. Now I will move into the next aspect, which is basically engagement with the literature on space economy. Here we have only considered those literature which is actually, um, you know, published in refereed journals or books, and we have not considered articles which are of a journalistic nature, published in newspapers and magazines. There are plenty of them, so uh, we don't consider those things at all. Okay, and the literature on the economic and social aspects of space economy is actually very very specialized. And has been published in extremely very very uh, uh, specialized journals like the Acta Astronautica. Okay, but uh, quite recently, space uh, uh, writings on the space economy has been mainstreamed with a major article on this on the U.S. space economy uh, by Vince Vince Seol, uh, published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. Journal of Economic Perspectives, by the way, is one of the three major journals published by the American Economic Association. And so it has got in 2018 an article which has actually looked at the evolution of the US space economy as that one which was dominated by the state sector and increasingly dominated by the private sector. 
and if uh, you might have heard about companies like SpaceX, et cetera, uh, which, uh, which is actually now uh, got the full range of capability to design, manufacture and satellites and launch vehicles and even launching them. Okay. So the U.S. Uh, uh, so the uh, the the interest economists under interest in space economy has uh, been sort of a jump started with the movement of the space economy away from the state sector to the private sector, as revealed by this main uh, article. But of course, if you look at the India specific literature, we can find six different broad issues which have come up for discussion. The first one is the historical evolution of space research in India. Okay, and we have put uh, some uh, uh, representative studies here. And in fact, the authors of both these studies are present in this August audience now. The first one is uh, the, the book by Gobal Raj, in, uh, published in year 2000, which has looked at the historical evolution of space research in India. Okay, and the most recent one is the one bo book edited by the moderator, Professor Bian Suresh, which is the Space and Beyond Professional Voyage of uh, Professor Kasuri Lankan. Uh, which contains a, uh, a very detailed account of the uh, evolution of the space sector in India. Okay. Thereafter, you have, and I must uh, also say that uh, when we look at an issue specific uh, uh, review of literature, it is not going to be mutually exclusive. Some of these studies, uh, you know, some of these studies actually talk about various things, but we have distilled out the most important component uh, or most. Uh, the most important aspect emphasized by each of the study is to put them into each of these uh, pigeon holes. The next one is role of state in creation and nurturing of a space research. And here you have a very interesting work by Angathevar Baskaran, uh, which is actually a doctoral dissertation done at the University of Sussex and published in the journal Technology and Society in the year 2005. And of course, the most recent work by Narayan Prasad in the year 2021, which is a European Space Policy Institute study. Okay. Then, of course, the most celebrated work of uh, Professor U.S. Shankar, which, to which uh, Professor Pierre, uh, Suresh also referred to, which is measuring the cost-benefit analysis of uh, uh, space research. Okay, and this was published in 2007. And uh, but of course, uh, and the cost and benefit is measured rather in a very qualitative way and not exactly in a quantitative way, because a measurement of cost and benefit. For instance, a, benef a measurement of benefit, for instance, would require an idea about the size. And, and, uh, but of course, you don't find any such thing in the Shankar's work. Then, of course, Murthy and Shankar, uh, Shank Murthy, Shankar and Madhusudan, uh, which is actually a paper. Uh, uh, these, are, these are papers published in, in, in the uh, various uh, journals, for, um, for instance. And, and also, uh, 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 you have the Kasuri Lankar and Shaijumon. Uh, paper which also talks about uh, the uh, the cost benefit analysis uh, paper again the Professor Ben Suresh referred to that one as well. Okay, then of course you have articles which have looked at uh, the development of specific space technology like for instance launch vehicles. Gobal Raj does talk about a lot of that in his uh, 2000 book, and uh, Rajanam Nagapa in a very interesting article published in a journal called Astropolitics also talk about the uh, development of. Uh, uh, launch vehicle technology in India. Then, of course, you have uh, uh, the analysis of the space budget part of it, uh, which uh, I myself have a paper in the International Journal of Technology and Globalization in 2013. And of course, Kasur Rangan and Shajumon uh, also has a uh, discussion of that in, uh, in, in, in the book, which is edited. And then, of course, you have uh, 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 papers which have looked at uh, specific areas of space economy, like, for instance, the remote sensing technology. Uh, uh, you have a few papers uh, which have been published in Acta Astronautica and also Technology Forecasting and uh, Social Change. Now, uh, you can identify several gaps in the literature. None of the studies have addressed itself to measuring the size and structure of the space economy. And as I mentioned, even those studies which have looked at uh, the uh, uh, cost benefit they have not really quantified the size of the space economy, nor identified the different components of it using an, idea, uh, an accepted framework and, and so on. Okay. Second is that accepting for most of the studies, uh, you know, most of the studies are a decade old and you know, they are at least uh, 10 years old and so on. And a lot of changes are much water has flown under the bridge uh, during this period. And space technology has now started diffusing into a number of new domains, such as location services, home entertainment. For instance, DTH never existed before in India before 2003. 
you know. So it's a basically a, 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 a new technology as far as uh, we are concerned, or in, even as far as the world is concerned. Okay. And the next important aspect is that, uh, as has been pointed out by the Vencier article uh, in the Journal of Economics Perspective, there has been a gradual withdrawal of the state uh, of the space economy from every country in the world. So you have a movement from government space to commercial space to what is now referred to as new space. Okay, and and uh, so uh, 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 and of course uh, the the uh, within India, although the government is slowly so seems to be withdrawing, uh, do you have continued government support for uh, some of the, uh, for instance, the human space space flight program, etc. And so, on. so given this kind of a literature, our study is basically seeking to fill in this important gap in terms of trying to understand both the size and the components of the space economy. So now invoking the OECD framework, we first start looking at the contours of the space economy. And we look at uh, the following contours. We start with the space budget, then go on to the space assets, the human resource, uh, which is employed in the space sector. And the sp then we estimate the space manufacturing industry uh, using a certain methodology, which uh, we can uh, uh, Describe uh, if there is time at the time of discussion. Then we have uh, the we have estimated the size of the satellite telecommunication sector, which is one of the most important component of the space uh, economy. Then we have the satellite Earth observation, which is the remote sensing, the insurance market, the international trade in space products, and the in uh, 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 indicators for measuring the innovations of the space sector. So let me start with the space budget itself and show some interesting aspects. Now the space budget. And I must say that all our data is derived from official sources. We are not dependent on any uh, any private sources of data at all. So either it is from the the budget documents, questions which are answered in the parliament, uh, or um, the national account statistics of the government, or the the detailed balance of payments table of the go government, uh, or the the inter the data from the intellectual property organization, uh, the IPO, intellectual property office of India. Or the USPTO uh, and uh, and publications from the Scopus Index publications uh, from Scopus. Okay, so we have only used official sources of data for by and large everything, excepting for Scopus, which is of course a private data bibliographic database, and uh, and that's that's basically the database that one would use if you are using a bibliometric study. Uh, and of course, you can use Web of Science also, but we have used Scopus. It's basically the same. Okay. And in terms of the, so we start with the space budget. We have given the nominal budget. We have given the real budget, which is the nominal budget adjusted for inflation using the implicit GDP deflator. And we have expressed that as a percentage of the GDP. And, and you can see that the space budget as a percentage of the GDP has gone down from 0.09% to 0.05 over the years. In fact, it had already gone down to about uh, 0.05 by about 2011-12 and remaining at that level for uh, 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 for a, a long period of time okay and in fact the entire period of study that we covered 2011 12 until 2020 21 the space budget as a percentage of gdp has not shown any increase at all and in terms of nominal in nominal terms it has even become turned negative in year 2020-21 okay so that i think is an interesting aspect of the thing so how does uh, india compare with the rest of the uh, uh, world so here we have the space budgets of a number of important space-faring nations in the world, uh, uh, and China is uh, uh, including that of uh, China. So what you can see is that uh, space budget, in absolute terms, is difficult to uh, uh, interpret because it's related to the size of the economy. So our space budget is only about 1.94 billion dollars. Uh, uh, US spends about 43 billion, and China spends about 8 billion. Uh, and uh, uh, but of course. Uh, 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 that being the case, that's that's because those economy it's basically related to the size of your economy. So as a percentage of your GDP, what you find is that US is about 0.2% of the GDP. Russia is also something similar to that, uh, and India is 0.06, and uh, and uh, whereas China is about 0.04. So we are actually spending more than China in in terms of in, uh, when you relate that to uh, to our GDP. And we are actually spending more than Germany, Italy, and also Japan in terms of us. Uh, so in the, uh, the amount that we are spending is not so small compared to uh, other spacefaring nation. 
as a, uh, of course, when you adjust it for purchasing power parity, which is what economists would do because of the different purchasing uh, power of the currencies, uh, our uh, the size of our economy actually falls from 0.06 to 0.01. Okay, so from that point of view, we are actually much smaller than if you use the purchasing power parity uh, uh, in terms. And as a percentage of government expenditures, uh, because there is a general feeling that we are spending a lot of space research, it is true. But as a percentage of government expenditures, we are spending 0.22%. And we, are, we again compare very favorably with uh, other countries. For instance, France spends only same amount compared to us, which is, a, which is actually a, a developed country. And of course, the United States and Russia spends far more uh, compared to us. So in other words, while in absolute sense, our, uh, you know, in, in an intertemporal sense, our space budget has come down, but in, uh, but in an interspatial sense, what we are spending is not uh, uh, that low. Okay. Uh, that low. So we, now I go to the next one, which is space assets. Okay. So we have estimated the space assets. Basically, uh, the, uh, the space assets that we have estimated is basically assets, tangible assets. Because when you talk about assets these days, we have to talk about tangible assets plus intangible assets. Intangible as tangible assets is very easy to understand because these exist in the form of satellites, launch vehicles, all those equipments, uh, laboratories, factories, uh, and so on that you have. Okay, if you are if you are able to put a number on all these, add up, add them up, then you can uh, find out the total stock of these um, assets over a period of time. Okay, but what is important is that in in a high technology sector like the space industry. The, the, uh, we also need to consider intangible assets. And in fact, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, the, the important thing about uh, modern economic growth is that the role of intangible assets are more important sometimes than tangible assets. And what are intangible assets? Intell intangible assets are basically intellectual property rights, uh, uh, which exist in the form of patents, know-how, uh, blueprints, designs, etc., and so on, and also brand names, and uh, and things of that sort, okay. And economists have been trying to uh, measure a, a, a number on these intangible assets. And now, uh, in our measure of space assets, we are focusing entirely only on tangible assets because it's not easy to measure the intangible assets in space technology. And I will talk about that a little later uh, uh, because uh, when we discuss the innovation, we measure that in terms of patents, etc., and so on. Because in the case of Indian space research, a lot of the technology is actually not patented because they are trade secrets. So they have used trade secrets as a kind of a intellectual property right uh, a mechanism and not uh, not as uh, in the form of a codified uh, thing like a patent. Okay. So the space assets uh, of the economy has been going up. So if you take the most recent period, it's something like thirty six thousand crore, thirty five thousand crores. Okay. And we have taken this uh, as a percentage of the communication and broadcasting uh, uh, sector as revealed uh, through the national account statistics, because uh, that is the sector to which to, to which the space economy should be uh, belonging in, in the national account sense of the term. So when you take that as a percentage of the, uh, 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 the communication and broadcasting sector, it has actually gone up uh, uh, to uh, to almost like for to uh, almost like fourteen percent uh, in the most recent period from about six percent uh, when it started. This is on the uh, as you know this uh, chart has two uh, y axes, so you should be looking at the uh, the right hand side uh, to to measure the uh, the share of the, the the space assets as a percentage of the communication broadcasting services, and as a as as a share of the entire public sector assets, assets in the public sector, it is about 0.17%. It is quite low. Okay. But so the, uh, in terms of assets, it has actually gone up, but there is a considerable underestimation of the size of the assets because we have only taken into account satellites and launch vehicles. We have not taken into account, uh, basically the equipments and, uh, 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 the, the various capital goods and so on, which are, uh, basically used. I am sure that's an enormous, there are a large number of, uh, uh, because ISRO itself has uh, a large number of facilities which are bred, uh, which are uh, distributed throughout the uh, country, and we have not uh, taken into account because we simply don't have uh, uh, data on any of those. So there is a uh, uh, there is a certain amount of other estimation there. 
Then we move on to the human capital in space sector. Okay, so this is uh, we have estimated this directly from the ISRO. Uh, these are the number of people who are working in the ISRO. So if you take that, the total number of scientists and uh, uh, engineers and administrators working in ISRO has increased from uh, has remained more or less constant. It has slightly slightly decreased over a period of time from about eighteen thousand to about seventeen thousand now. Okay, but what is interesting is that almost like uh, seventy eight percent of these seventeen thousand, if you take to, to two thousand twenty twenty one as uh, uh, as uh, the latest year for which data are available. Okay, seventy nine percent of the seventeen thousand are scientists and engineers, which is what one what would expect in a high technology sector like the uh, space sector. Okay, so this is a kind of an ideal model that one would expect in a research organization, because in a research organization, you should be having more scientists and engineers rather than administrators. Uh, in fact, what is interesting is that when ISRO has downsized over a period of time, it has downsized basically the administrators. Basically, the administrators have come down from about 5,700 to about 3,700. And I am raising this point because a large number of scientific organizations and research councils in India has gone through this process of downsizing as part of the overall policy of privatization of the uh, uh, of the government. But they have, in most cases, they have downsized at the cost of uh, the scientists and engineers. They have uh, retained all the administrators have managed to retain the seats and managed to reduce the seats of the uh, scientists and engineers. But that doesn't seem to be the case in ISRO, which I think is a very desirable thing to happen. Next, we will move on to the space manufacturing industry in India. Okay, so this is divided basically into satellites and launch vehicles. We have seven different types of satellites being manufactured. Cumulatively speaking, we have manufactured something like 121 satellites uh, from 75 to 2021 onwards. And we have, in terms of launch vehicles, we don't include the sounding rockets, about 81. Uh, so again, we have seven different types of uh, 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 launch vehicles. In, in fact, you can see GSLV Mark III here. This is uh, the technology to which Professor B. N. Suresh was, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, associated with, and including, I think, RLV also. Now, uh, uh, we have estimated uh, the size of the space manufacturing industry. In fact, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Shaijumon and Professor Dudwal can come in and explain the, uh, uh, you know, the the process through which this has been estimated over a, a period. Of of time and what one can see is that the rate of growth in the last three years has been quite negative now it's rather difficult for you to uh, uh, to to sort of summarize these uh, large number of numbers so what we have done is we have identified some four distinct features of the space manufacturing sector here first one is that the hardware is manufactured almost entirely domestic domestically with domestic components so this is a very very interesting case of course i am not saying that it is uh, um, you know the no foreign technology is involved at all there is some foreign technology involved and there are some foreign uh, uh, imports of certain components also is involved okay but by and large you know the import component of what we are making is almost 100% indigenous and that i think is uh, i am emphasizing this point because we have a large number of other industries where things may be made indigenously, for instance, the mobile communications, okay, mobile phones. Number of mobile phones are made in India, but with imported components. But, uh, you know, so, uh, so we can have a number of things made in India, but the share of imported components in them may be pretty high. But uh, this is uh, an example of an industry where uh, everything is done indigenously. And so that I think is a very interesting aspect of uh, the space manufacturing sector. The second one is uh, most of the hardware is fabricated by the initially by the ISRO in its in-house facilities. Of course, it did enlist the services of certain private sector companies also during the earlier time when it was government space. Okay, if you take government space, commercial space and use space as the three broad evolution of the space sector. Okay. It did have some amount of uh, private sector involvement, but by and large, it is done by uh, the uh, ISRO itself. Okay. And the entire disembodied technology, which exists in the form of uh, uh, know how, designs, uh, uh, blueprints, etc., and so on, uh, that have been developed by ISRO itself. Because given the dual use nature of this technology, it's not possible to get this technology from anywhere. Okay. You have to develop it almost in house. Of course, you have, you do, again, there are exceptions. 
uh, and uh, uh, for certain specific technologies, uh, we have relied on uh, in foreign source of technology itself. But by and large, again, it's entire, the entire disability technology has been developed through in-house efforts. And again, as I mentioned before, right at the beginning, it's an instance of uh, uh, frugal innovation, because if you take the average cost of a satellite that we have manufactured over a period of time, uh, uh, given by the previous table that I just showed you, it's about 330 crores. And the average cost of a launch vehicle is about 114 crores. It's only a fraction of what is uh, available internationally. I'm not able to measure, uh, you know, uh, show a ratio between international and uh, domestic prices because you do, really do not have uh, the uh, the prices of these available easily. Now I go on to the space telecommunication services. This is a place where massive amount of overestimation is done by various uh, by the OECD etc. Where they have tried to include the entire mobile telecommunications, the entire broadband as part of the space telecom. Now we have not done that. For the simple reason that most of the mobile telecommunications is done through terrestrial networks. We are not done through space uh, network at all. It is only the location services which are involved in uh, the, uh, and that too at times, because in location services, we also use a combination of Wi Fi uh, and terrestrial networks, uh, et cetera, and so on. Okay. So, what we have done is we have only taken about a certain percentage of the total telecom revenues as estimated by the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, as belonging to the space sector. And then we have taken the entire DTH, the direct to home uh, uh, tele tele television services, as uh, uh, part of the space sector, because that's entirely based on space technology. And this, as you know, was introduced in India in, uh, the policy was 2001, the first DTH services started in 2003. We have four DTH service providers in the country, and they all de depend on uh, space technology, and the, it is basically the sales revenue of those four companies which are put there. Okay, so the total space telecom is basically an addition of uh, the telecom plus DTH, and so that's you can see about twenty five thousand eight hundred ninety crores for the late, latest period. And later on, you will see that this is one of the most important components of the space economy of India. Okay, so space economy in terms of its impact. When you're trying to measure the impact, you can see the impact happening through the, uh, you know, uh, this telecom services and DTH services. And I must mention that DTH services is now going to be adversely affected because with online streaming, because you also, you have this, the last two pandemic years, you have an online streaming of entertainment, Netflix, et cetera, and so on, which have come up in a big way. And so if, uh, uh, consumers are, we have about 74, 70 million, uh, 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 you know, you know, DTH subscribers in India, um, so in India, we are 1 of the largest, even larger than in the United States. Okay. In fact, 41% of the cable TV man, uh, users in India are actually having a DTH. Okay. So the DTH is a very important segment, as you can see, almost like 50% of this uh, uh, space telecom. And later on, we'll see that it is actually an important part of the space economy. And if uh, that's going to be adversely affected with, with online streaming, then I think the size of the space economy may get reduced in the future. Then, of course, we come to the satellite earth observation. Here it's basically remote sensing. And of course, uh, uh, we have some giants and the remote sensing uh, sitting here, Professor Dadwal, who is actually our collaborator, was also the head of the National Remote Sensing Agency for a certain length of time, uh, and uh, he will add on to the discussions. Now, the data products which are uh, sold by the uh, National Remote Sensing uh, um, uh, Center uh, uh, or agency, and, and since 2008, it's as a National Remote Sensing Center, which is part of the uh, Department of Space itself, I mean, sorry, the uh, ISRO itself, okay? And, uh, but the main problem with the, the, uh, uh, the remote sensing, which is, uh, is that high resolution maps could not be used in India because of our, uh, the, the earlier policies. Okay. And with the result that, uh, a lot of the technology that we are developing could not be actually sold because the high resolution maps, uh, uh, in fact, the threshold level was something like uh, 5 point some meters. And recently it has been reduced to 1 meter at the bottom. But if you want uh, resolutions which are less than one meter, uh, you know, those data products cannot be sold by ISA. 
So that is that is something which is actually been uh, been, been sort of uh, throttling the, um, the size of the remote uh, uh, sensing uh, or earth observation sector. So we really, really do not have uh, uh, any estimates. We have some uh, some sparse estimates which are available from a CHA report, Comptroller and Auditor General report, which was done in 2011, which has estimated the data products which are sold by the NRSC at that time. Uh, which has increased from about 21 crores to about uh, 42 crores. But these estimates are only available until 2007. Now, of course, it is part of what is called the geospatial sector. And, uh, and, and I believe that particular sector is uh, increasing. And in fact, you can see that the sector is bound to increase in the future because you have a plethora of policies which have come up in the last two years, just 2020 and 2021. We have five different policies. We have the space-based remote sensing policy of India. We have the guidelines for acquiring and producing geospatial data and geospatial data services, including maps. Now we have the national geospatial policy. We have the Indian satellite navigation policy and the drone rules, all of which is going to now uh, uh, demand high resolution data. So what I'm trying to say is that because of these policies and because the threshold level of the uh, uh, of have been of resolution has been reduced. We can expect that the size of the earth observation market will uh, is bound to increase quite manifold. Professor Dudbar can add to this during the time of the discussions. Then we move on to the insurance market for space products. Okay, and uh, I must say that there are three uh, propositions that we need to uh, make. First of all, all Indian satellites are uh, you know are manufactured by ISRO and they are not, uh, which are manufactured by ISRO are not insured at all because all the satellites are owned by the president of India. And since it's owned by the president of India, there's no point in insuring them. Okay. And, uh, uh, but second, Indian satellites, which are INSAT and GSAT series of satellites launched from abroad, from Kurov in, uh, in, uh, in French Guiana, they are actually um, uh, insured. Third, the foreign satellites launched by Anthrax and ISR on commercial terms are insured by satellite owners. But in this case, the insurance is uh, uh, the insurance companies may be foreign owned. They may be based abroad. Whenever we are uh, measuring the size of the insurance market, we are looking at the premiums which are paid, the premiums which are paid and claimed. Okay, so that would be the basically the size of the insurance market. So we have estimated the insurance market. Uh, uh, for painstakingly for each of the, um, the the satellites, and we have estimated this to be about fourteen hundred crores. This is the cumulative in, uh, uh, figure from nineteen ninety uh, until now. It's about fourteen hundred crores is the amount of, uh, and you can see that uh, the insurance premiums are not very very high. We have uh, some sparse estimates about the insurance which are claimed because of failed uh, uh, failed launches uh, abroad and so on. And, and so on. Maybe in the discussions, we can uh, talk about that. Next, we will move on to the international trade in space products from India. The data are sourced from the UN Comtrade, which is the most comprehensive source of data on uh, uh, imports and exports. And, and these are in millions of US dollars. We are hardly exporting anything, of course, which is because we are an import. This is an import substitute industry. And the imports that we are uh, doing is basically subsistence and components and so on. Okay, so in fact, we are not making any any mistakes here in terms of identifying the imports of space products because we are doing this at the six digit level. Okay, uh, at the uh, so those people who are familiar with the balance of payments table, you know that you use a, a higher the number of digits, higher the level of disaggregation, and the more accurate that you are actually uh, estimating. So we are basically estimating satellites and satellite launch vehicles and subsystems which are imported. It shows some kind of fluctuations, and uh, uh, we are in, not in a position to explain why these fluctuations come. But of course, it, it can be explained in terms of uh, a possible explanation, maybe in terms of uh, uh, the, the the launches that we are doing. Okay. Now, lastly, we look at the innovations in the space industry, and innovations are measured using scientific publications in the space area, patents which are granted in the space area, and then new space startups which have been formed. Uh, uh, quite recently. So let me put some, represent you some numbers in each of the three. So for publications, we use basically the Scopus Index publications, which are available from the bibliographic database Scopus. This refers to year 2016, 
and, uh, and these are the percentage share of each of the spacefaring nations in the total number of Scopus Index publications. Indian scientists have published something like 2%. So when compared to uh, United, United States alone has about 21.5% uh, followed by China. Of course, China is always very high in all these uh, scientific areas. And Germany, uh, in, in fact, China has almost, almost crossed Germany, UK and France uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Italy, etc. and so on. But India's publication rate in this is not that bad. It compares very closely with, uh, uh, you know, uh, with the other countries. So we have about 2% of the number of publications. Rather difficult to interpret in terms of whether it's increasing because we don't have the inter intertemporal data. Now, in terms of the number of patents, we have both the stocks and flows. I start with the stock of patents. These are the total number of patents which are available, granted to ISRO from uh, right from the beginning until now. So the, the total stock of patents is about 270 patents. And if you distribute them all across these different technologies, about 72% of them are in launch vehicles, followed by satellite communications in 21%, and, and uh, computing networks at about 6%, and Earth observation about 1%. Okay, So you, you can see that it is in launch vehicles, we seem to be having a large number of uh, 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 patents. And although it's satellite communication is the one which is actually most important in terms of, as I said, uh, uh, as part of the space economy, there we have our number of patents are not that high. Okay. In terms of uh, flow of patents, uh, these are the total number of patents which are granted to ISRO uh, at, the, uh, at the Indian Patent Office. And uh, this is based on a question which is asked in the parliament. You can see the number of uh, number of uh, patents are granted are very small, but one should be very careful in saying whether it's small because generally Indian uh, uh, agencies have very small number of patents. Okay, generally speaking, most Indian agencies have very small number of patents because we simply don't patent anything at all. And I've already mentioned about the importance of trade secrets for ISRO, so they may not be because when you are patenting, you have to codify. And and and, uh, and 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 so on. So ISRO may not be wanting to do that, and so that's one of the uh, one of the reasons. Now, in terms of new startups, uh, based on st uh, uh, some studies, we see that there are about twenty six startups which have come up uh, in the recent past. And what is interesting is that most of those startups are in the satellite spacecraft subsystems area, and they are based in Bangalore. In fact, Bangalore seems to be the uh, the uh, space capital of India. In fact, ISRO itself is headquartered in Bangalore and many other ISRO installations are also in, uh, in Bangalore. Okay. But what is interesting is that we also see that uh, there is these two companies, Skyroot and Agnikul, which is in launch vehicles, etc. and so on. Okay. Another interesting thing about these startups is that some of these startups have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, started by ex-ISRO uh, people, uh, scientists, and ISRO scientists also have been associating themselves with, this, uh, uh, with, with these uh, new enterprises. And I understand that these startups have raised a fair amount of uh, venture capital funds uh, during this uh, period as well. Okay, and according to a question which is asked in the parliament, they say according to the new startup policy of India, there are 75 space startups, as against 26 for which we have detailed information, there are 75 startups. And uh, and I must also say that as part of the innovation, one should also be mentioning the large number of technologies which ISRO has developed and is in the process of uh, licensing that to private sector enterprises. Okay, and this is going to be very important because uh, ISRO has created an ecosystem or a central system of innovation for in space technology. So you have these different types of space technologies which have been developed uh, by ISRO, and ISRO has also sort of uh, dusted up its technology transfer policy and you can identify three broad components in this technology transfer policy one is uh, technologies such as these which are developed by isro through its own in-house rnt efforts which are being licensed to private sector companies private sector and public sector uh, companies on a payment okay that's one kind of a strategy that is uh, that is a kind of a dominant historically speaking dominant strategy the second one is isro is also planning to develop technology jointly with uh, um, with, with other uh, uh, other organizations, e even with private sector organizations, uh, okay, jointly with the private sector organizations. So that is another joint development of technology. That is the second uh, 
uh, strategy. So you have a, a sort of some kind of technology transfer both ways happening during uh, during that period. When there are complementary assets which ISRO doesn't have, and some private sector firms have a complementary as asset which uh, then you know it's possible for them to collaborate and so on. Okay. And the third kind of strategy that you can discern is basically ISRO funding uh, uh, research in well-known academic institutions uh, in the country like the IITs and the Indian Institute of Science. And that's the response strategy of the ISRO. So this strategy is 2020, so it's too early to make any comments on this. The only thing that I would like to mention is that in the, in the meantime, the government has also set up a new public sector agency called New Space India Limited. So all the technologies which ISRO has developed will be uh, licensed to the private sector firms, sold to the private sector firms through this NSIL, New Space India uh, Limited. Okay. So finally, now we come to the most important as aspect. So invoking the UK space economy, we have now measured the size of India's space economy, and that is something like uh, 36,794 uh, crores for the latest period. Adjusted and un unadjusted and adjusted. Adjusted is basically uh, we remove any trace of double counting. Okay, if you remove any trace of double counting, that is uh, adjusted. Now, you need not look at the adjusted figures because uh, the unadjusted figures itself is a conservative estimate because we have not included remote sensing, for instance, in our data because we simply don't have the data. Okay, so 36,000 over approximately 37,000 crores. So, so if you take that as a percentage of India's GDP, right now it is about 0.19% of our GDP. Okay, it used to be about 0.26% and it has come down to 0.19% of our GDP. So the size of our space economy, relatively speaking, has come down over a period of time. In fact, you can see that the site, even in an absolute sense, have been uh, negative for the last two years. So this is space, the size of a space economy is extremely sensitive to the space budget. So whenever the space budgets are reduced, the size of the space economy comes down. Now, how does this size compare with uh, other estimates which are available? Okay. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Other estimates which are available. Now, the only other estimate of India's space economy available is by the private sector consultancy organization, PWC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Okay. They have in one of their recent reports, um, you know, a 2020 report, have given one number for 2019 without giving any idea about how this number was arrived at. Okay. And this figure is something like $7 billion. So that compares uh, uh, somewhat fav very favorably with our estimates because our estimates for 2091, I'm sorry, 2019 is uh, 6.21 uh, US, US, uh, 6.21 billion uh, USD billion. Okay. So uh, uh, whereas PWC is 7 billion. Okay. So we are pretty close to, and as I said, we, ha we are actually a kind of a, uh, underestimate. So our estimates, uh, assuming that the PWC estimates, even if they have not specified the steps are, uh, which they have employed in arriving at this figure, you know, uh, is correct. Uh, our figures are pretty close to the, uh, uh, pretty close to that. Although our figures are actually showing that the size of the in uh, this uh, space sector is now gone down from 6.1 to almost like five billion dollars for the latest year. Okay, and uh, uh, you know. The ISRO in a in a document called Unlocking the Space Sector made in the Make in India and the Make in India program, uh, what you can see is that they are they have taken this PWC estimate of seven billion, and they are projecting that that this will go up to fifty billion by year two thousand twenty four, and that's in our view not possible at all, because we are only five billion now in two thousand twenty two, and in by two thousand twenty four to Go in, uh, to to grow into 50 billion, uh, especially when the space budget has been reduced, uh, seems to be uh, impossible. Okay, and uh, so that's uh, uh, and in terms of of, uh, 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 of the global space economy, at about five billion for the latest year, we are about one percent of the global space economy. But again, the, uh, this figure I'm, I I'm, I won't use it that much for the simple reason, or we won't use it that much for the uh, reason that. The, the size of the global space economy itself is very much overestimated. Okay, so if you put Indian 
data on the numerator and the and a high, a highly conservative Indian uh, data on the numerator and a highly bloated figure of the global space economy, the denominator, naturally the uh, ratio will be pretty low. Okay. How do we compare with the United States? Okay, because United States, as, as I mentioned before, has a fair amount, uh, a fairly accurate, uh, at least we believe it's accurate because they have uh, used a satellite account uh, supply and use, uh, use tables. So it's almost like estimating the GDP of the space sector. Okay, that's what they have done. So that's about 194 billion dollars. These are in millions of dollars. So 194 billion billion dollars. The US and India is about six uh, uh, six thousand two hundred and uh, you know six point two billion dollars. Okay. So that means we are about two point eight percent of the US. Our size of our uh, our space sector space economy is about two point eight percent of the uh, US economy. Now, in terms of our uh, the uh, the uh, the components of the space sector. I already mentioned that uh, we have the space manufacturing, the space operations, and the space applications. And if you remember the all the the UK space framework, there was a fourth one which is ancillary services. But we have included the ancillary services also in space operations uh, uh, itself. So you, what you find is that it's a very lopsided structure with the space applications consisting of. Satellite telecommunications and DTH accounting for about three quarters of the, uh, the space economy, followed by space operations, which is basically space technology, space science, et cetera, and so on. And space manufacturing only accounts for about 4%. Okay. And that's basically also because of the frugal nature of our manufacturing, which has uh, taken place. How does this uh, structure compare with other countries? If you compare that to the UK, for which you uh, 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 this compares almost exactly like the UK, except in, in, in their economy, in their space economy also, space applications is the largest, DTH is, is, is the largest component of their uh, space economy. So our space economy mirrors almost like uh, the, uh, the UK space economy. Okay. Then finally, we look at the uh, productivity of space investments. There are two ways of looking at it. One is looking at the capital output ratio, uh, you know, so the investment to output ratio. So you are investing, and then uh, and then you relate that investments to some output. Second methodology is basically you identify those specific sectors which are available uh, affected by space sector, quantify it, and look at see whether that sector is growing. Now, of course, that will that would mean a detailed impact study, okay, which is uh, uh, beyond the scope of our present exercise. So we have used this capital output ratio study. Now, in the capital output ratio study. We have, of course, the adjusted and unadjusted. And now, for that, uh, we will just look at the unadjusted uh, ratios. Okay. But there are two caveats which we have to, uh, and the way to interpret cap capital output ratio is that if capital output ratios are increasing over time, that means there is inefficiency in investment. Uh, you know, same dollar of investment is leading to less amount of output in the future. That's what a rising capital output ratio is actually showing. Okay. But in the case of, uh, but capital output ratios look uh, crucially depends on the lag that they have used between investment and output. Because the investment that you're doing today will not result in output today. So you can't relate the investment today to output of today. But unfortunately, that's what we have done. So that we have to take this because we have assumed zero time lags because we don't know the, what is the ideal kind of time lag that is involved between investment and uh, output. Second is that a lot of the, uh, so the time lags are extremely important for the, in space technology because a lot of the investments which are done now may fructify into newer technologies several years from now. Okay. So relating investment of today to output of today can be problematic. But despite that, so if you look at that, you find that the capital output ratios are increasing, which means inefficiency are investments are becoming inefficient. But you have to take it with a pinch of salt for the reasons that I have mentioned. Now I'm in a position to conclude the presentation. And uh, so what we have done is essentially we have looked at the, um, you know, because there is a worldwide, there is a kind of a, a, a interest in trying to measure the size and components of the space sector. And we have done that for the, the Indian uh, space economy. Okay. 
And, and we have also showed that the government budgets play a very important role in creating and nurturing the space industry because the years when the government budget is going down, the size of the space economy goes down because everything that is created in the space economy is through the government budgets. So if government budgets are reduced, you will have a, a difficult, and, and unless that uh, is the, the position which is vacated by the government is taken up by the private sector, that will take time. That will take time in terms of uh, so, and space manufacturing and logic technology have evolved so much that it is uh, possible even for small and medium enterprises to enter. So as uh, economists, we would say that the barriers to entry into space manufacturing has reduced. Earlier, uh, you know, uh, small companies cannot, now even startups are getting into uh, manufacturing satellite launch vehicles and uh, satellites. Early, uh, several years before, you could not have thought about uh, doing that. So it's possible now for uh, private sector to enter into because of the changes in, in technology. And especially uh, the combined effect of all this is that you have a possibility of a large number of uh, 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 private sector enterprises to emerge. Now, space economy has evolved considerably and now accounts on an average. It is 0.19% of the GDP now, but on an average during the period 11, 12 until 2020, 21 is about 0.23%. Okay. We have also noticed a decline in the government budget recently, leading to a reduction in the size of the economy. The slow growth of remote sensing is, uh, 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 you, you know, basically because of our inability to provide, uh, you know, high resolution data. And once that is provided, then I, I suppose, uh, uh, of course, these are also governed by security considerations, etc. and so on. Space applications industry still dominates, DTH industry still dominates. And I, I told you about the threats to the DTS industry from the online streaming industry. Capital output ratios have been showing an increase, but there, we, we need to have a careful uh, interpretation of that uh, in view of the uh, zero time lags and other things, assumptions that we have uh, uh, mentioned. The recent spate of public policies directed at the space sector is very likely to enlarge the size of the sector through allowing the private sector to, uh, to, to enter improved integration with global private uh, uh, service industry, uh, private space industry, et cetera, and so on. Okay. And so future direction, space technology is now going to play, see, no, nobody ever thought about space technology being important in our drawing rooms. Okay. So when we are watching the television networks these days, and we are having the set-top box, uh, you know, we are having the space technology. We are basically consumers of space technology. And with remote sensing, location uh, services, logistics, etc., becoming extremely important in the future, we, we, uh, as I mentioned before, space technology is going to become extremely important in the future. Okay, so future research should focus more on the direct and indirect impacts of uh, space technology now that the size and structure of it is understood. Of course, the size and structure can be improved upon, but now that it's been understood. So I thank you very much for your patience. And uh, that's the end of our presentation. And uh, we can over to you, Professor Suresh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, it has been very, very exhaustive coverage of uh, India's space economy with specific focus to size and structure. I think in a very detailed fashion, you addressed uh, important aspects like uh, the analytical methods to measure the size, the components which are involved in terms of manufacturing operation applications, also detailed on the survey of earlier studies and gaps. And of course, uh, we have really brought out three important indicators to assess the size of the space economy, namely inputs to space economy activities and outputs. And here you have covered a number of uh, different activities in detail and ultimately ended up uh, giving the impacts of uh, the space economy. And of course, a lot of statistics are there. I think everybody has heard and I don't want to repeat. Before we open the today's webinar for open discussion, I would request both the Professor Dadwal and uh, Dr. Saji Moon to say a few words because you are co-authors. I would request Professor Dadwal then to Dr. Shaiji uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Suresh. Uh, one uh, important point I think which uh, uh, we could point out is uh, that there are identified gaps or uh, 
things which have not been considered as we said the sale of data also the impact uh, especially the various two three studies which are available they have tried to do the indirect impact and have got you know substantial numbers like you know 50000 crore for weather forecast or such a similar very high number for use of fishery forecast etc uh, but i i would still be on the uh, conservative side third what is likely to happen uh, things like one web and small satellite constellations etc and uh, the internet web those things are likely to grow uh, there is a small gap which comes because uh, since 2007 uh, the the landsat data is free and from 2014 the sentinel data is free so there are no sales of moderate data and the offtake of the uh, there have not been too many satellite but there is a substantial sale of high resolution data and also substantial sale of high resolution in the security sector now those type of numbers at the moment are not available uh, but uh, i think we we need to uh, keep on digging but use only the official numbers as professor sunil mentioned we have only used the government of india budget papers and the response uh, to the parliamentary committee for approval of budget or the annual report of the department of space isro so uh, the whole uh, exercise is that maybe we have similar number like pwc but we exactly know the component we know what is missing so this study could really set up a benchmark to further extend and add on the various other dimensions of the space economy which anyway i believe is going to take a entirely different trajectory thank you sir thank you dr chaijumon would like to add anything further yeah th thank you sir thank you for this opportunity i am really happy and proud that you know sir you are sharing this moderating this event so i wanted to add couple of things one thing actually already uh, Pro professor dandwal sir mentioned about the data source we used only the public data mostly isro annual reports and parliament answers plus the public sources of reports cag reports and all so that we used and no, no nothing maybe if data available this analysis can be can we can make it little more robust next is this estimation of manufacturing industry uh, this manufacturing actually space manufacturing industries data is not available public so we made some kind of analysis and assumptions say for example satellite manufacturing what we did is see annual size of satellite manufacturing in india is estimated by adding the distributed satellite manufacturing cost of all satellites how did we do that because you know they for example a satellite is launching this particular year we took 20% of total satellite making cost as this particular year's manufacturing cost and then we actually the remaining 80% we divided it into like t minus 1 20% t minus 2 30% and t minus 3 30% and we added all those together in that year and made it as satellite manufacturing cost similarly launch vehicles also same assumption we made and we did that analysis in that way so there were a lot of challenges we got some some places the data was missing and we estimated some data based on the accepted scientific methods and added to that especially some of the insurance data we were not having public and that also we actually estimated based on the outcome budget of isro which says about the like say for example insat data insat satellite when they send so what is the total insurance cost like that we divided and so those approaches that we made for this including in uh, estimating this manufacturing data so those challenges we could cross but this is kind of a starting point of like discussing the space economy or analyzing the space economy of the country so maybe lot of 
limitations are there in, at least in some area but it is actually a very very scientific attempt first time that you know we, we would be able to complete and that at vetted by some of the important reviewers also sir thank you for this opportunity sir thank you thank you both uh, dr dadwal and dr shayjumon now i think uh, this session is open for uh, discussions i think any questions anybody may have please raise it i think let us have another 10 to 15 minutes uh, very, very interesting uh, dialogue and discussions. Yes, uh, uh, John, Vivian, Prashant, right, sir. Then, of course, now we'll, we'll go one by one. John, Vivian, Prashant. Yeah, shall I? Shall I? Yeah, okay, Dr. Naval, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you know, first of all, I must compliment uh, Professor Sunil and his uh, team for a very extensive and uh, detailed uh, understanding of the size and structure as as it points out of the indian space economy uh, definitely this is not uh, this is not uh, uh, this is not saying anything about the impact or the cost benefit studies etc i think we should uh, basically say that it is related only to the size and structure uh, the second point is uh, the center for uh, economic uh, applied economic research in uh, delhi as dr dadwal mentioned made a very detailed analysis of two of the impact studies, one for fisheries and one for the uh, meteorology, weather forecasting, et cetera. So they are worth pursuing uh, in other disciplines and see how much we can do. The third point is this is basically, we are talking about the Indian civil space economy, because obviously there is a larger component, uh, which is not, uh, not which is non-civil with respect to the space economy itself. Uh, I think that also we have to keep in mind. Now, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the analysis of uh, giving some numbers uh, saying that we are less than, uh, you know, our, our products, whether it is a satellite or a launch vehicle is much less than others. I think that requires a much more rigorous way of saying because the components that go into costing are, uh, are entirely different. And uh, so I think that area needs a, some more uh, rigorous, uh, uh, rigorous uh, 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 you know, rigorous analysis uh, to be done uh, at that point. And uh, one other thing is, that as far as remote sensing is concerned, you know, uh, it is likely that uh, the entire scenario has changed since last 2010 uh, or even earlier than that. So I think it would be very, very uh, uh, unproductive uh, to make much of the inferences with respect to the remote sensing data, etc., because uh, uh, nobody is bothered about data. Everybody gets data free. It's only the final value addition that you do that only is becoming uh, extremely important. And uh, I, I know that there may be reasons for considering only 2010 to 2020, but most of the infrastructure which has been built for space has been there since uh, 1970 or so. A lot of money has gone into that thing. At least a notional figure of what that space economy which has been put into to build this infrastructure in order to get this kind of an output that we are getting today it's also very important in fact uh, professor sunil mentioned it because the basic assumption is today's budget gives you the today's output which is ab absolutely not correct and so obviously you must see and that of course is also government of india uh, budget figures they would be available i think if that is also included uh, it would add value Overall, I find it's an excellent uh, beginning of a very important topic uh, that we need to have, but we must be prepared to change our outlook because the whole scene of space economy is likely to change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Navalgun. Anybody would like to respond? From author side? Professor uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Navalkun, for those uh, five different points that you have made. Uh, uh, yes, benefits. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, we have entered our present study by, uh, you know, proposing that we should be looking at the impact of uh, uh, space economy on rest of the economy. And you refer to those NCER study on fisheries and meteorology. We will take a look at that. And uh, uh, we will take a look at that. So I, I think that would be my response to that. 
Then, of course, the Indian civil space economy and the non civil uh, space, even to say something about the civil space economy has been not easy because data yeah. is so deficient in this area. And uh, in, in fact, uh, it is not just in India, but also in many other countries other than the United States, where they don't have a, see, unless you have this detailed supply and use tables, uh, you know, you end up adding all kinds of things and then coming out with a huge uh, space economy, just like uh, the global, the size of the global space economy is $470 billion. Uh, and, and, you know, and uh, you include inputs, outputs, uh, uh, you know, stocks and flows and, uh, and, and all that. So that would be a difficult task there. Then ratio of domestic to foreign, uh, when I when we mentioned about the, see the standard economist way of looking at uh, efficiency of domestic production is we have a, a, a ratio called the nominal protection coefficient, which is uh, uh, the, the domestic price, which is actually paid by the consumer, uh, plus the price that you would have paid under free trade conditions. Okay, if that same good was available from abroad uh, with no restrictions, what would be the price that you would have pay, paid? Okay, so ratio of those two prices will give you a nominal protection coefficient. But the problem is, in the case of uh, uh, all these space products, you see, uh, most of the international reference price that we can construct from the balance of payments table only refers to subsystems. They don't refer to the full system because, uh, and also the satellites that we are making is very different from the satellites which uh, the United States is making or the Chinese is making. You know, it's quite different. So that comparison would be pretty uh, difficult. But nevertheless, uh, uh, so so that's why I said even when I'm making a comparison between the Mars orbiter mission, the Mangalyan versus the Mavern, they are not direct. They are not really directly. You know the same technology, okay? But they come pretty close because both these things are going to Mars. I, I think one is going to the surface, one is going to the atmosphere of Mars. So, so the but it comes pretty close. So that's the only thing that you can do as far as uh, uh, economists are concerned. That remote sensing, you said that the it is basically the final value added which is more important. Yeah, and in fact there is a, a recent report that we have seen on the geospatial industry but unfortunately we are not not able to quote that report because we have not bought that report so the, they don't allow us to cite it you know and i don't want to get into any kind of problems with people for citing and citations and so on so uh, that gives you a very high figure of uh, in fact it, the size of the geospatial industry is as big as the space economy in the, itself it's almost like five billion dollars i think or or even more uh, what they have estimated you know but uh, uh, but i think we will we will take a look at that we'll take a look at it. so thanks again for your comments we'll certainly take a look at it. yeah i just want to mention to you that uh, as far as uh, uh, data that you would like to have uh, maybe you could consult somebody from uh, in uh, you know uh, dr aruna chalam from uh, in space okay okay we'll send we, we will send a, uh, we will google him and find out and then uh, yeah yeah uh, no no we have two hands raised on the screen uh, oh, john hands. Vian prashant john vian prashant uh, good evening sir uh, you open the video if you can so that uh, we will know who is right. If you have, if you have difficulty, forget it. Yes, sir. Uh, ah, that's fine. No. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, so, uh, go ahead, Professor. Uh, so, sir, uh, we, when we uh, measure our normal economy, so we were looking at GDP and now with the concept of sustainable development and uh, all these things, we are becoming conscious about carbon. We are having system of carbon credits and all and going for zero emissions and uh, zero carbon footprint. So in a way we are uh, in, like, for example, when we have, we talk about green GDP, we are, uh, you know, to my understanding, we are subtracting the damage that we are doing to the environment. 
so when we are talking about uh, space economics or space economy uh, my doubt is like are we considering things like the uh, the costs which will be involved in remove cleaning up the space debris tomorrow thank you yeah can i uh, can i answer that please please yeah yes i mean, I, I think you have raised an important point of valuation of space debris in fact some people have done it but unfortunately i am not sure whether we have created too many space debris you know and uh, so but uh, uh, you know that must be done that must be done but even in our uh, normal gdp computations can you show me any place where uh, green gdp has been estimated in a correct way you know we are not doing it even for our terrestrial activities you know the enormous amount of damage due to various kinds of pollution and other kinds of bad things that we are doing, we are not able to quantify and subtract that effectively from. So we, you know, we can talk about it, you know, by saying that you should do this. But I have not seen any real decent estimates even for terrestrial activities. Then right. how do you, you know do this for uh, space access, space activities? The concept is well taken but actual implementation of that concept into empirical data would be difficult but i've seen people talking about space debris uh, quantifications okay people are i've seen uh, about that but uh, uh, we have not done it because we have just at the first step you know and uh, we are only sitting because we stretched the hand, our legs we you know we have to sit properly so we are only just just about to sit that's all and so uh, that's a good suggestion that you have made. Thank you. Uh, actually, sir, uh, regarding uh, that only, I had one more uh, this thing that this asteroid mining in 2015, it seems uh, US has, uh, uh, I mean, legalized or passed a law allowing its citizens to, uh, you know, mine space, space asteroids. So when you think of uh, like how does like we are talking about millions and billions and it seems space mining will take it to the level of trillions. So what is the future you think with respect to that from an economic perspective? No, can you see, uh, I, 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 see while I appreciate your question, can, can, did anyone predict the global financial crisis? So let's talk about things which are in the earth itself. Never did anyone predict the pandemic? Not, not only that, you know, there has to be a policy cleared by the appropriate agencies. We can't just like that take a dream something yes. today and tomorrow you do something. It's not yeah. possible. The policy yeah. is framed keeping the national interest in mind, and accordingly, it has you know, that's where you youngsters have to come up with an idea, push for it, come out with the proposal, make it accept. Then I think it will happen. So, right now, what uh, Professor Suri's telling is right. We can work on what has happened and what is likely in the next maybe five, six years. But otherwise, uh, dreaming beyond that is uh, uh, not going to help us. Okay, I think uh, let me move on to Kriti. I see the hand raised. Is there? Hi, sir. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, but uh, can you just open the video? Um, sir, I, my um, I, internet is weak, sir. I can't use my audio and video together. I'm sorry. All right, go ahead with the question. Right. Yeah. Sir, my name is Kriti. I'm a PhD scholar in the Department of Econometrics, University of Madras. Uh, my area of research is artificial intelligence and machine learning in Indian agriculture. I'm sorry, my question is not specifically based on in, uh, space economy. Uh, as far as my area is concerned, I was not able to find any specific data sets to support my study in the sense that the data showing uh, there is an increase or decrease in agricultural productivity by the implementation of this uh, technologies in various states. So any of the dignitaries, can you suggest me or help me with any data sources in this regard? Is there any anything that the space economy sources can do as you have mentioned uh, remote sensing technology and all? Uh, I, I suggest you send me an email at vk.dadwal at nias.res.in. Okay. Can you mention one more, once more, sir? NIAS? Uh, NIAS.res.in. Okay, okay, sir. All right. 
We let Thank us you. move on to Dr. Murthy Remila. I see another hand. Are you there, Dr. Murthy? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Dr. Murthy from URSC. Uh, yeah, I really want Murthy. to see you by Remila. Uh, <laughs> sir, not showing uh, your face. Your video is not there, sir. I am calling from office. Video is not there. Okay. All right, yeah. go ahead. Then. I was uh, thanks to the professor. I was looking for some future uh, potential estimation or some market potential graph, but it was only telling about the last one decade, two thousand ten to two thousand twenty-one. Because now that the industry is opening up, I thought the professor's talk will cover something into the future, at least a short term or a medium term. Any response? Uh, see, Dr. Murthy, one yes, is uh, we have not looked at other than the communication, the revenue flow model, right? Yes, sir. Since it is not uh, the services of earth observation and other things have not been quantified. So neither we have the past decade nor we can predict for the future. So most of the services, if you see uh, the past decade, the budgets were for the government and resource assessment and disaster. But now what is happening? If you look at many of the companies, those which are not for the safety and security, they are for financial and for the uh, navigation services. You get my point? So yes, uh, now those things depends upon uh, a product which is marketed for a location. So I think unless we do a more granular detailed uh, things of the type of service and the market and the size of the market, I don't think we will be able to make any forecast uh, of the a likely market available in future because it's an entirely different type of study. Uh, we wanted to get the base correct. What has been flown by government and what exactly is the size and which are the sectors which how do they contribute? I think this study is only restricted to that. You you have spent in Antrix, you are aware at one time you were selling some products, then you were licensing ground station, then most of the money was for importing satellite data for others. And now uh, that everything has evaporated. So the technology at that time and its exact matching has to be done. Uh, I think we, we have not considered any of those factors. Okay, sir. I, I just wanted to look for that because incidentally, yeah, no, no, I, I agree. It's an important thing. But we were not able to reach them. Incidentally, my research in uh, IAC was modeling the market uh, potential for space based remote sensing data. But that considers actually what are all the factors to be considered and what is the equation or a model to estimate the remote sensing potential of a given market. Even that also will not project to for future. Every country by country, market by market, we have to evaluate. Anyway, thank you, sir, and uh, nice meeting you. Uh, I switched on and I, I, I switched yeah, on. We are happy to time. see you. Okay. Yes. Yes. Nice Dr. Ravila Murthy has been at NRSC also, and he has such a long career in Antrix Corporation also. Very nice. Okay. Okay. Thank any you any other question anybody has? All right. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, you know, I would like to give a quick summary, not what has been discussed, but uh, the, we should not stop here. This is a very important area. Uh, you know, like we have heard several questions right now. Uh, what I would suggest for the consideration of the, the authors and for resuming the activities on space uh, economy. One is uh, maybe you can try to summarize the today's proceedings of this webinar and uh, bring out what really has happened. That could be one action. And uh, my request to you is, uh, I think we should try to create a peer group 
to work on space economy in addition to you and possibly center of development studies should be the lead organization in this because they have the very talent uh, they can really do with these two if you are able to do we can try to rope in uh, one representative from isro itself from isro quarters at the level of um, a strength scientific secretary or additional scientific secretary so that it gets the authenticity. After having this, then I think uh, we may seriously consider to, to organize one day workshop wherever appropriate. Uh, I think have some kind of brainstorming on this. Here in this short time itself, we got several questions. If we do, we get a clarity of how in what direction, what is that we should do. And in my opinion, all this should culminate into writing yet another book like what Yu Shankar did in 2007. I think, you know, this is the a sort of comment which uh, Kasturangan always makes with me. We have done in 2007, Suresh, but then what happens since then? So much has happened. Plus, I think it's a it's good time because we have come up with the reforms of in space. NCL, I think, is one of the questions asked. And it is really going to take a different turn. So maybe from now to another one year, one and a half years, or even two years, we should try to bring a, an updated space economy addressing these issues. I think it is worthwhile. So these are my suggestions. And uh, if all of you agree, I think it will be the, some kind of, uh, I would like to hear comments from all three authors on this particular, uh, my viewpoint, and then uh, let us see. If all of you agree, we will record it and then take it forward. We'll start with Professor Sunil, then Dadwal, and Sergio Moon. Yeah, you have basically made uh, four points. First is summary of the proceedings of the seminar, and this will be done because we are recording the uh, 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 the webinar, so this can be easily done. And we also have a full length paper. So the full length paper and the slides and the recording. Uh, why, why I am suggesting is I think while yes. you do that. I think one or one and a half page crisp summary, executive summary has to be brought. Yes, then, yes, you yes. Know, we, I, I can help you to reach reach out to the, yes. the, the powers that be so that you know yes. they get accused to take it forward. That's yeah. the whole yeah. idea. We will see how to yeah. do it. Okay. Yeah. Second one is that you uh, said that we should be creating a peer group to work on the space economy. I think that is uh, very well taken. And uh, I, I think with uh, uh, both Dr. Shai Juman and Professor Dadwal, we'll immediately start uh, creating that uh, peer group. A and uh, we can, of course, now meet virtually, uh, even if uh, we are in, distributed in different places and can discuss various issues. And this Monday workshop also is a very good suggestion. And, and there, you know, CDS has to take a yes. leading role because, you know, otherwise uh, it, it will never proceed. If CDS yes. can agree to take a lead role, because, yes, you, know, you are working in that area, and uh, otherwise, yeah. if any other ISRO center or other things, it will be difficult. Yeah, yeah, Th that we will do because I will place it before the committee of direction of our center uh, in the month of April, and then uh, we will formalize it and take it forward. For instance, this particular this particular study itself was done. Uh, uh, you know, we started just approximately a year ago, and it is derived no funding from any source. We have done it uh, on our own. So I think it is possible uh, if the if, if the uh, you know if, so that's possible. And then once we have uh, you know done a sufficient number of studies after the peer group is created, then we can think of this book. Workshop one workshop in between. Yeah, one, one workshop, workshop and then the book and and the book. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Dr. Zadwar, your comments. Uh, th thank you, sir, uh, for your suggestions. Uh, we will take them all. Listen. Since now I have some time available with me, I'll be able to devote some time to this. Mm -hmm. And I will also reach out to my network uh, of Earth Observation and State Remote Sensing Center, and then some of the commercial companies, uh, including there's a media company, Geospatial World. So uh, I also happen to be one of members yes, of one yes. of their think tanks. So the geospatial and application part, I think we'll be able to spend uh, some effort and then use Professor Sunil's you know, guidance to bring it to uh, academic level. So we'll take this up. Sir. 
Did you want, want to say yeah. something? Th thank you, sir. Thank you for that wonderful suggestion, sir. Definitely all those points, very valid and important points. We will take it forward as like, you know, always you are, you are advising me that to, like you were, I know that you were saying for long about this book. Uh, so that we will definitely do, sir. One more thing that one more point, your good suggestion about that getting a person from ISRO headquarters that will actually make it easier for accessing to certain resources also. That also we will do after uh, due consultation with you, sir. Thank you so much. That is because, you know, a lot of debate and discussions were there in getting the authentic data. The moment we rope them in, uh, then yes. whatever data that comes from that source has to be authentic. You know, that, yes. is, that is one advantage you will see. That's where that uh, your uh, executive summary, if you give, uh, we will try to speak to the right people and see what best we can do from our end. Sure, sir. Okay, Thank I you. think uh, with this, uh, we have come to end. Uh, sir, uh, sir, excuse me. I'm uh, Murthy again. Yeah, tell me. You tell Murthy. Uh, though I'm not sensing now, sir, by, by, by virtue of my job, I would be interested to join the peer group and contribute if given an opportunity. Oh, yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these, these three are the key people. I think they will steer and I think whoever is interested, reach out to them and it will get formed. That's why we are not naming anyone. Yeah. You know, that what was yeah. not there now today, they have created a platform. I think we are just trying to sort of improve upon and take it forward. This is one of the very, very important areas. And uh, the, if you really want to further give proper shape, it's also worthwhile to have a word with Dr. Surangan. He is very, very passionate about it. That much I know because yeah. having spent almost three years in uh, in editing that book, I know for sure what he wants. Okay. Yes, this, I'm uh, only volunteering, volunteering from myself, that's all. All right. <laughs> I think Dr. Radwal has noted. <laughs> okay, let me let we have come to the end of today's webinar. And uh, uh, first of all, uh, very, very productive and uh, uh, thought-provoking session. And uh, we must... Uh, Thank Professor Sunil, Professor Dadwal, and Professor Sajimoon. They not only have done excellent work and excellent presentation today, not only that, triggered so much of debate and discussion. I'm sure that they will take it forward. I think give them a big hand today. So they deserve that. With that, we come to the end of uh, today's session. And thanks for everybody. If Thank you so much. It up, I hand it over to Professor Sunil. Yeah, uh, I, I take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor B.N. Suresh for sparing his valuable time. And, and it is very unusual for a moderator to come out with very tangible suggestions for taking, uh, you know, the research forward because most people will just stop at that level. So he has, uh, that shows his devotion to the subject. And uh, so I think all the points that have made are extremely valuable and we will take it forward. And I must Thank uh, Professor Dadwal and Dr. Shaiju Mohan for uh, really, because this, uh, this came really from their side. Uh, and, uh, you know, and both of them were uh, extremely cooperative and helpful. And it was really a pleasure to work with them, you know. And uh, we have had several virtual meetings, including a rehearsal uh, a few days ago. And, uh, and in fact, twice, isn't it? Twice, twice we had uh, rehearsals. And, uh, so I think it was it was really uh, nice fun to work with uh, uh, this scientist, um, uh, and so and I thank everyone for uh, coming uh, and attending this seminar. Thank you so, so much. From my side, I would like to thank Professor Suresh, Dr. Navalgund, all participants, and then also especially thank Dr. Shaji Moon who did a lot of hard work in collecting the data and tabulating. And most important, Professor Sunil, because we don't have a background of economics and his work and interest in Indian economy, IPR and science has really shaped this work. We only could collect some data and then explain to him. So for you know updating us on the economics nuances of this topic, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Professor Sunil Mani. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Suresh, sir, for this wonderful suggestions and taking it forward. Thank you so much. It is kind of like dream come true for me. We will definitely take this forward. And thank you to Professor Sudil Mani for taking all the pain 
and then all this and thank you also to professor dadwal sir because he is the one that actually made me into this and we together uh, at least reached to this level thank you so much a Lo lot of things that we wanted to do thank you sir thank you so much thank you thank you thank you very much and bye bye have a nice weekend thank see you later. sir Nice okay. weekend, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye.